his own strengths and uh, what what the uh, vicissitudes of war were going to be about, and uh, thus he was on a training base, training learning curve himself. Only when he got to a very productive state in a six-month tour, because everybody was supposed to get a uh, battalion command tour in combat, he got jerked out. So I guess my view would be that the systems of the Army in terms of equality overcame and, and deficiency for different reasons, not war fighting efficiency, right. but for force raising efficiency. Uh, they took over and dominated the uh, headspace of uh, <coughs> the uh, Army and thus led to this thing called infusion in Vietnam, and uh, the perpetration of this hoax uh, continues on such things as uh, the view that you now have, even though you're in command for a two-year tour, uh, people get a, a look at, uh, gee whiz, i got to be able to do everything I'm doing on a two-year time sway, <coughs> or 18 months before when you had uh, tank so it becomes a uh, flog the troops for 18 months, them out, yeah. uh, ring them out good, make sure I get my ticket punched well and I survive it, as opposed to a longer term which says I'm in it for a long haul, and, uh, whether I command for two years or four years or whatever is inconsequential. Shy Meyer, as a matter of fact, tried to go into a, a, a business of saying uh, the nominal tour is 18 months, but people could be in command from 12 to 30 months, depending on how well you're doing. Well, he got beat down by, by the four stars after he worked at it for about a year or two years as a uh, as the chief of staff of the army. They said, "No, we see if we take a guy out earlier, he think that he's not doing well, or we take you know didn't want to face up to the guy that yeah that's right he wasn't doing very well." Or they may have taken the guy out after 12 months and uh, made him the Division G3, or the Corps G3, which is really an important billet. But then it got to being, well, then the promotion boards won't understand whether or not he was good or bad or indifferent. Therefore, everybody goes a standard of 24 months. Wickham tried to wrap around that, 21 to 27, uh, when he was the chief. But even then, it got to be mil percent one. So the problem here is that that we don't have the same uh, principle base associated with the assignment of people, the cohesion of people together, uh, as we do, for example, with the principle base that on the 15th day of uh, every month you measure whether or not your uh, uh, equipment is ready to go or not. sermonizing about that. Now in my own case, you see the Army had raised me differently. The Army had raised me with a uh, with a three-year tour as a, as a PA and E guy in uh, at the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, at the rank of uh, Colonel. I spent all my colonelcy as a, as a brigade commander. It's only a colonel for 26 months or something, total. Uh, less than that. No, 26 days. Uh, and then I'm back into the resource management game again, which is always a long view. And uh, spent four more years in it. Then uh, I'm in the personnel game, which is long view. And then I'm in the Chief of Vice Chief of Staff of the Army for a long view. So by the time I get to be the Vice Chief, in my case, I am a guy who's had two, recruiting two, is four and five years of PA and E, he is uh, nine and two years as desperate as 11 years of my, gen of my colonelcy and generalcy 
is spent as a uh, long-range viewer. So it shouldn't be surprising I look at things in a long-range view. Secondary, tertiary uh, outcomes of the decisions made at the spur of the moment. Not everybody's given that opportunity. I think you have to train people with the long term. We certainly don't do it at the workout. No, and we don't do it with the ticket punching process of having to get so many things done in such a way. Such yeah, that's right. As a matter of fact, now the uh, ticket punching game with respect to uh, having to add joint service, two years worth of joint service, further uh, inhibits developing these kind of long-term views, unless you happen to hit a joint service view that, or joint service billet that's got some long-term view attached to the work it does. So I think we have a problem with that. I think, you get, I think it should be investigated thoroughly, and I think it should be uh, uh, included in curriculum development at uh, the Army War College, and uh, People should be measured about uh, whether or not they can do it at the Army War College, because essentially uh, the work of generals ought to be on a time horizon, four stars now, ought to be on a time horizon of 10 to 15 years. I mean, everything he does ought to be on, ten, I mean, day-to-day -day stuff shouldn't be involved in, but you find that chiefs of staff of the Army are involved in day-to-day -day stuff on a daily basis. Uh, guys at probably the uh, major general level ought to be looking at it about six years. Uh, guys at the brigadier general level ought to be looking at about three years. The average brigadier general is in an ADC boat for a year, maybe a year and a half. Come in. Excuse me. Sir, Captain Waterman gave me permission to leave, so I'm, I'm leaving now. Just want to make sure you're still feeling okay. They'll be disconnecting us soon. Okay. okay? Yeah, tell her she needs to bring me a menu. Okay. okay. I sure will. For lunch, because I'm like going out of here. Okay, sir. Have a nice day now. Thank you, Frank. Take care. Sir. So, uh, that's one that's hanging out there. Don't work. Working hard on that. Another one I wanted to ask you about was uh, when you were the vice. Uh, what was the interplay of influence among ops and intelligence and logistics and personnel uh, as far as who who was driving the train. Uh, there's a sort of tradition that the three is the most important staff uh, element, but at the Department of the Army level, when you are looking far down the road, uh, did you find that you had problems training the uh, major staff elements to, uh, to take the long look? Uh, I think you always have a problem with uh, taking the long look at a staff that is located in Washington, D.C. Uh, The Army staff as a corporate body ought to be looking downrange in order to serve the needs of the Army uh, 10 to 15 years. Because work is sort of divided into three, three tiers of work. And those three tiers of work are the work I do to support my bosses. Yeah. I just wanted to pay my respects to the general. I know he's busy. Hi, General. Are you over here for work? I'm over here. Ferris Kirkman. Colonel Kirkman. Colonel right. Merrick. Nice to see you, indeed. Don't let me get the record. Huh? Over here. I'm going to go to my room. I'll are you over here for overnight work? I'm over here for an indeterminate period of work. Get your head straight? Hmm? Getting your head straight? Don't get my head straight. It looks straight right now. Turn your head violently to the right. Thank you very much, but no thank you. 
You read in the paper yesterday that I, Pilot, I read, you be Pilot Booker's like you had to give you a stroke. <laughs> you know, on second thought, you don't want to have I that osteopath. You don't want that osteopath working on you. But I'm, I'll come I'm, in and I'm see you. I'm taking you know. enough of that other stuff, so it doesn't bother me. I'm, I'm I know you're pretty light. I'm three feet above the ground right now. You're pretty light on your feet today, aren't you? That's right. I'll be over to see you. Yes, sir. Are you up here? Next door. Okay, good. Nice, nice to meet you, you sir. Uh, But the be, so Army staff ought to be, the levels of work are, are doing work to help your boss. Doing your own work. And then delegating work and supervising work of your subordinates. In the case of the Army staff, it ought to be helping his boss, the chief of staff, who ought to be looking downrange 10 to 15 years. But the Army staff is also encumbered by things, agencies like OSD and the Congress which caused it to look very short range right. yeah, in terms of uh, going after money in the Hill this year for next year's budget. That's our planning timelines at OSD also are short range, relatively short range for headquarters of that size because it's essentially a five to six year timeline depending upon the years of the bomb. Uh, so getting people to look, take the long haul are important. There are, okay. You want a hamburger or anything for sure. lunch? That'd be great. Okay. You want to take it out? Well. You're done? It's done. I'm cooked? Tell you what, you're sitting here chatting. I'll leave it like this for the time being and then I'll come pull it out and come All right. On the Army staff, you've got uh, obviously the desk ops is the uh, paramount carabao on the Army staff in the ranks of Lieutenant General. Uh, but for example, he spends a substantial amount of his time in the JCS. So some of his subordinates carry key long term roles. One is the SS guy, the uh, strategy guy, and another is the uh, force uh, requirements guy. In the case when I was there, Jack Woodman C was the requirements guy. And uh, he spends all his time looking at because he's figuring out how much uh, <coughs> money is going to be put on weapon systems and the like. And uh, 
that's all long-term stuff. Uh, I think the Army staff has the capability of looking downrange, although I don't think it's their long suit. Yes, Spur does probably more. I think I think the two generals who have the longest downturn downrange view about it are the ops and the perk. And then the major generals that have the longest view about it are the uh, the RQ guy, the requirements guy, who's in the hardware game, and the uh, acquisition guy, who's in the staff, who has the requirement to bring the stuff on board. He's always looking. Is he in Deslog or is he separate? No, he's not in Deslog. He's in. Uh, he's, he was the uh, deputy chief of staff for uh, research development acquisition, and now that job has been put into the secretary based upon legal stuff from the, the acquisition reform. I'm going to use the one out in the hall. I'm going to use the one out in the hall while you're there. So I, I think there's some, uh, certainly some, some training that ought to be going, going on that equip people to do longer range thought process. Not a lot of people get a chance to do that. So the bench is generally not rich with people who can do that well. Were there situations coming up when you were the vice in which the ops or logistics uh, objectives would conflict with what was best for the personnel in the Army? Like, uh, one I can think of would be if, if ops decided to do basic training at one post, but uh, the log people couldn't come up with uh, resources to give them decent barracks and so therefore instead of having a good feeling coming out of basic they came out with a having lived in crummy situation. I don't recall many major purposes. Uh, I 
told you the anecdote. My deputy, when I was the uh, her, come in and tell me that he would agree. He had already agreed with the desktops that anything the desktops want to do, that the personnel community can support it. And I told him never ever say that again as long as he was working for me. Because in peacetime, you don't have a right to screw over people. I think in the main that uh, most people believe that the personnel system can do anything. And the answer is it can do anything. I mean, if you are in the Army, we can order you about and do you any damn thing you want to. But if you're trying to run uh, a, a personnel system that is generally fair with its people on the one hand, except in times of uh, really imminent crises, uh, then you have to make some time allowances to make sure that people don't get uh, shoved around, pushed around, etc. I'll, I'll give you a current example. We only have one Civil Affairs Battalion on active duty. That Civil Affairs Battalion was working on the aftermath of uh, Hurricane Hugo when we ordered it to uh, Panama, and they spent their whole Christmas down, the Christmas of 89 down uh, in Panama, and the following Christmas they were in the Persian Gulf. And the following Christmas after that they were in Hurricane Andrew in Florida. Now here's a case where you have only one Civil Affairs Battalion and a whole inventory of the United States Army. In order to ameliorate that, you'd have to raise another battalion, or you got to bring one in from the active or from the reserve components for extended uh, troop duty. Should the army investigate that for the for the business of ameliorating the personnel? My answer would be probably. You may want to think about having two of those, given the fact that you're going to have two near simultaneous. major regional contingencies in the new uh, uh, structure, the national military strategy. Uh, but, but moreover, because you have a uh, high demand of those on peacetime operations, uh, other, than, other than real war, then, then you might think about uh, whether or not we need more than one of those battalions on active duty. Spaces. So I think I think that personnel, uh, I can tell you, was taken for granted in the acquisition cycle. And we got that turned about with our program called Man Plant in the acquisition cycle. And people just assume that every Tom, Dick, and Harry and Jane you bring into the Army is uh, capable of doing anything for everybody on any kind of weapon system. And that just isn't so. And you have to think your way through what does it take to make it dance right. So I think there was, I, I believe, uh, that there was in fact a renaissance in uh, the 80s brought about by the success of the all-volunteer force in, in the line that When you have a draft and you discharge a person from service, the, the function of the draft is to bring you another replacement. And so a draft situation causes you in many ways to look at people as things as opposed to people. The all-volunteer system changed, I think, fundamentally the, uh, the way in which we treat and dignify people. Because what we're doing is we're saying that we want to conserve people. Because if we don't, we have to go back and recruit them again, which is hard to do. It takes a lot of money to go do that. And therefore, we are much more into the conservation of people. And, oh, by the way, if you bring in higher quality people, 
you know, and you don't throw out as many due to indiscipline factors, then uh, the whole atmosphere of the place in which you're living and working has been uh, substantially raised. I think the great, one of the greatest things, benefits of the uh, going to the all-volunteer structure is is the fact that we now treat people with more dignity than we did when they were directees because we thought that it was a free good. That's certainly been the big change and the results have been quite, quite remarkable. Do you have some views on the unit status report? I had the impression that you did, um, but we haven't talked about it at all. Uh, the fact that it counts people rather than capability and that sort of thing. I, I was wondering if you had any feel for what the constituencies were that insisted on its perpetuation rather than change or modification. Well, there's a uh, regulatory piece of matter that comes out of the Department of Defense, and JCS, that requires you to have a readiness reporting system. The Army has chosen to implement that uh, with a uh, once a month report, although that's not required in the uh, in the directing regulation. The directing regulation says you can have a living system, so you can report you can report every day on readiness if you want to. The Navy does that. The Navy reports changes on a living basis as you go down the line. The Army is one of those things that says, stop the music on the 15th of the month. Stick the thermometer in. Uh, stick the thermometer in your mouth and take your temperature and uh, hustle around for the uh, business of making sure that all your equipment is up on the 15th. If it's down on the 16th, so be it. The Navy's quite different about that. They report it as you go, so a ship can come up on the 15th and go down on the 17th and be back up on the 21st, and you get a you get a real live system in world. And I'd like to see the Army do more of that. Uh, but the 220-1 or whatever that particular regulation is, AR that describes our readiness system, uh, takes on a uh, more than you'd want. It takes on a uh, measurement system of your capability of stewardship of the units you have to be administering and can be used as either a reward capability or a uh, threat capability because you're not as good as the Jones boys. Day X. I'll, I'll get that. Me back out of here. Well, they're right. Megan, how come you're not working today? I'm in the hospital. Well, I went out yesterday and spent the day out. Well, I got in here about 10 o'clock last night. Are you there? No, I don't have any call waiting. Absolutely not. Oh, you're probably coming out. Yours is coming out of gas, sir. Are you working today? You're being. Well, I was going to ask you another question. Yeah. Um, when you were in Tradoc, there was a. You found that the SIDPERS error rate was very high, and you did something found about that, it. Uh, found that on it when I was a desk perk. Oh, did you? Oh, okay. Yeah, the SIDPERS error rate was 5% when I came. And the way I figured that 5% of 780,000 would be something like 37,000 errors per daily sit first transaction. So I told the AGs the new AG sit first rate, error rate would be 0.5. I can't say that that made a difference. If it, I was wondering how you, what you did about it other than that, uh, other than say that you pull up your socks. Uh, it was, 
the reason I asked was that Sid Purr's errors were such a high profile cause of heartburn among the troops. Want me to get that one? Yeah. Achieved success in lowering the error rate of Sid Purr's. Probably more flogging than consequential. I, I didn't do the same thing for the Sid Purr's error rate that I did for straightening out the promotion system and the number of NCOs. So I can't tell you much. Okay, next one I wanted to ask you about. I can tell you, we cleaned out, as I told you before, we cleaned out a lot of profiles. Yes. A lot of people who had been riding profile three suddenly became profile ones. Because they decided they would like to stay in the Army and go overseas and go into combat rather than get transferred from the infantry to the uh, quartermaster. That worked. That worked. Was there also bars to re-enlistment or anything like that? Yeah. A lot of forcing functions. If you're a profile three for an extended period of time, put you on a bar of re-enlistment, which said you can't automatically re-enlist until you're off the profile because we don't need you in this MOS anymore because you can't, can't yeah. function. Right. How about, did it have anything, did being on a profile affect eligibility for a promotion? Yeah, you can't get, can't get any Favorable personnel, favorable action. personnel action if you're on the profile, or if you're on a uh, barter in this very effective tool for causing people to take action. I also convened NCO as sort of part of the follow-up on NCO uh, ES was to convene panels for promotion of E7s, 8s, and 9s, I would actually fly out to Indianapolis and, and sit down with the promotion boards out there and tell them what it was I wanted done, you know, and why I didn't want uh, cooks promoted if cooks were in an overstockage place. You know, we gave them a little teeny tiny quota, but that would be it as opposed to you know, others. And, and the whole notion of this was to cure the imbalances so that we would be able to field and maintain the equipment that we had that we were, we were beginning to get uh, issued to us in large and substantial quantities. The whole notion of uh, the new equipment training and laundering in Bradleys, M1 tanks, MLRSs, all those new M mobile subscriber equipments and all that, they became uh, very important uh, to getting the personnel system straight. Mobile subscriber equipment is another good story talk about an acquisition story. An acquisition and people story? No, it's an acquisition of capability in the communications. Uh, I'll just keep briefly outline it for you. The Congress in the law that was passed in the sort of the summer, like August of uh, 81, uh, came into uh, knocking the communications account by, if I recall it right, uh, $135 million. So I called all the signal officers in the rank of general, no matter where they were serving in the Army, to a meeting in September before Fort Belvoir. And I told them in that meeting that uh, the, the DOD, or not the DOD, the Congress did not have confidence in our program for uh, acquiring signal equipment and that we were desperately in need of a new signal capability at our units. And therefore, since the, the, all of these signal officers knew which way the rabbit jumped, then uh, they were to go into a uh, task force mode and within 30 days give me the answer on what the new uh, communications architecture would be. This is sort of unheard of. It's like calling all the armor officers together and telling me what you need. We're going to do that. What we do is call TRADOC 
go to Trade Doctor to tell us, and they tell you about three years from now what it is you need. So this cut through all of the levels of circuitry in terms of trying to come to grips with a vexing problem. So I think it took them 42 days, but they came back in 42 days, and they gave me a dump that said essentially, we need to we need to go to off quote, off-the-shelf equipment, in the book. And there are two systems which are available for procurement. One is the Rita system in France, and the other was the Termigan system in uh, England. So uh, I uh, took all my papers to the uh, Undersecretary of the Army, Jim Ambrose, who was a good friend of mine, and uh, told him this story, and I said, okay, I want to proceed on, on putting out a uh, winner-take-all bid uh, that would be open for international competition or teaming arrangements between U.S. and international competition. And uh, he agreed with me, and together we formulated this uh, very short request for proposal. And the upshot of that was we put it on the street. Termigan in England went with uh, Rockwell and uh, GTE joined uh, a French company that built the Rita system. They may have a blank here at the moment and uh, Aerospatial. And uh, so the two uh, overseas vendors were in a head-to-head -head competition for a 20-year contract. That contract was uh, opened and uh, the, the board looked at, the review board looked at them and awarded the contract from the time we had the meeting in September, by the 31st of December of the following year, we had awarded the contract. And 19 months from the time the contract had been put out for bid until we put the first equipment in the, in the field it was 19 months. So the total elapsed time with signal officers was about uh, 26 months. That is unheard of. That's a fast turnaround, all right. Now but that that contract was a unique contract uh, for American and uh, for, for the Defense Department. And it embroiled Margaret Thatcher calling Ronald Reagan, telling him that they had been victimized. And uh, he launched, he had an investigation launched, and it turns out that the thing that lost it for the Brits, among other things, was the fact that they had used their own inflation indices instead of ours on the uh, rate of borrowing money, you know, borrowing British pounds in American currency to get all those things lashed together. But uh, that was one of those success stories. It was uh, getting a new item in equipment in just a, just a little over two years from the time that we see thought about it. Just, it's an unbelievable story. It is, yes. And uh, we gave the winning company 20 years worth of uh, fixing it up, you know, depot, maintenance, and overhaul, and all that kind of stuff. We also had another feature in that contract which says any money that you could save by uh, innovative product improvements in the system, you may do that as long as you maintain basic configuration control. So they redesigned the system a couple of times as they were delivering it, taking advantage of new technology as a uh, new technology for, uh, came upon the scene. And the savings they met, they were able to plow back into new equipment so they had packet switching to it and a few other things. So it really turned out to be a, 
an astonishingly good program, but it broke every rice bowl in the uh, Army material from there. Do you have any internal sweat as well as the con conflict between the Margaret Thatcher? And well, we had internal conflict on, uh, for example, one of the things he said was the contractor will do the uh, training of new people to uh, learn the system. So immediately Fort Gordon comes up and says, we'd like to bid on that contract and bring it in-house, which meant I'd have to give more people to teach the course. Right. So. We said, yeah, you can go do that, but you got to bring it back up here. And then when we brought it back up and looked at it, we said, we can't afford the people it takes to uh, teach the course. We're downsizing, not raising up, so we had another thousand instructors to get down. So uh, that's one of those good news procurement stories. The other one I talked to you about was the A Tacoms, which is sort of the uh, same sort of thing. You know, you look around your career and you say, Can, did you put your hand on a couple of things that really turned the tail? And I looked at it myself, and I, I give myself credit for the Patriot uh, anti-missile people, the ATAC weapon system, and the MSC. Those, those are three that I think that I personally shepherded through the equation. Uh, What's so the A Tacums? I don't think you have told me that. A Tacums is the one that uh, the guy came in and told me he was going to fit, fit on the MLRS. Oh, that one, right. Okay. And I told him, no, the missile's too big, one, it's too long, you'd have to have a different launcher. We're not going to do that. Make it fit the current launcher and we'll buy it. So, so it did fit the current launcher, redesigned the missile, and uh, we bought it. It saw service in the Gulf. MSC saw service in the Gulf, and the paper saw service in the Gulf. So all three of those were timely add-ons to the Earth. Was your role in the Patriot to tell them we're, we're, can't, we're stopping funding until you get it fixed? That was one role. The second role was telling the, uh, the uh, project manager at the time, who's now the chairman of the board, that uh, he had to proceed on with company IR and D funds, uh, independent research and development to uh, provide a, uh, as much of a anti-missile capability as he could to the extant Patriot system. So that required software changes, some changes in the missile, some changes in the uh, algorithms used in the uh, radar screening process. And uh, so they did, and uh, that was essentially done on corporate money, and then we bought enough missiles to send them to the Middle East. And it stopped the Israelis from getting into war and stopped some incoming rounds, although they're not designed, but you know, in the overall, it's not designed for the purpose of the war. What was in it for uh, the company to make these changes? What was the character well, you used? Well, what was in it was the notion that they, they, they could go after a new and emerging threat. Uh, the emerging threat being proliferation of SCUDs, SCUD launchers. Whereas they had, that system had been manufactured for the purpose of going after uh, fixed wing breathing aircraft. Uh, this then gave them a, an opportunity to go after missiles, so it was a, quite a difference in the change function. Right, well, it's a major change function. It's good for the Army, but uh, did it expand yeah, the contract it, at all or anything? Yeah, what it does is it gives you more money to uh, bid on the uh, business base that's already established in, uh, for manufacture of missiles. So you add a new missile line to it and that causes you to buy another 500 missiles of one kind of another. Although you don't have to buy any new launching infrastructure. Launching infrastructure remains the same. There was a story about, uh, uh, in the sort of material and personnel integration process, uh, whereby I think it was when you were in Tradoc that was it you who set up the system of rolling modernization of the various cores uh, to give one core, for example, a new kind of weapon or communication system and. Uh, 
training to go with it and the doctrine to go with it. Uh, do them one at a time. Well, yeah. There are two things about that. One is, in the case of MSC, old subscriber book, I designated the lead core to get that would be third core. And I wanted to get congressional buy-in, so I said at the same time you do third core modernization MSC, you will also modernize the reserve divisions allocated to the third corps. And then I would get all the lawmakers in the Congress to sign up because we're modernizing the active and the reserve at the same time because if you had to go to war, you all had to operate with the same radios. And they love that because they love the reserves. They love the Guard and Reserves, so they love to give them money. And so they love to give money on something the Army wants to give them. Fine and dandy. So, but, the, but on the other kinds of modernizations, we had to go in sort of what I call a stepwise function in order to assure that you brought a core along at the rate at which the core could accept and the Army could plan to field and the acquisition community could produce the equipment to field. Battalion level units with this new equipment. So, with respect to the tank game, we started with the third ID because it was on the border and would be the unit that would be close to the border uh, if you had a uh, incoming German or a Russian attack about it. So, there was some there's interaction between us and the field about who would uh, get the various items of equipment, and we tried to spread it around a little.